So it's my pleasure to introduce Andreas Andreu, um, who's giving a talk about AI and ML for embodied systems at the edge. Okay, thank you for, uh, this is a fantastic uh, forum and I'm really happy to be here and uh, talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing that relates to tiny ML at the edge. So um, and our, unquestionably 2023 is a year of generated AI. And uh, it was actually predicted about a hundred years ago in this comic, uh, in this cartoon by H.T. Webster in 1923. If you look at the small text on the bottom, in the year 2023, when all our work would be done with electricity, cartoons would be generated by machines. You have a cartoon dynamo, which actually drives a little robot that draws the cartoon. And then you have the idea dynamo on the top. And then he's talking to a friend on the phone and says, well, we can go uh, fishing now. We don't need to be here in the office to be drawing cartoons. So uh, fast forward to 2023. This is a, uh, a, a picture cartoon generated by Chacha uh, GPT about a month ago. Uh, Prom generated an image showing a student giving a talk about Chat GPT. So, what is the edge? Well, there is various descriptions of what the edge is, um, starting from the Arduino Nano to the Kendrite 210, 5110, Google Edge TPU and the NVIDIA Jetson family. Of course, these are also chips at the end, uh, devices at the end, the Pulp NN by Benini's group, which is a eight risk five processors. The Spinnaker 2 project by uh, the group in Dresden, Christian Meyer and Ferber, which is 172 M4 cores. We, we actually built our own hardware as well, neuromorphic hardware. We have a RIS-5 neuromorphic microcontroller that has specialized architectural units to interface to event-based cameras and also a computing memory core. And for a bigger chip we just presented, a, um, a, uh, a design that has 77 computing memory cores, two Silicon 5 uh, uh, cores at the edge to manage the system with high-speed networking. And um, uh, the main idea behind this thing is that we're getting about five mebit per square millimeters using a four transistor SRAM design for the array. So that really why this is kind of the state of the art in density and of course, we want to be to the 500 and at the 500 megabits per square millimeter, we can start thinking of putting the whole language models uh, on a chip. So let me talk a little bit about algorithms now. And I'm going to take this uh, model, this uh, cartoon diagram here to talk about this neuromorphic approach, cognitive approach to building machines that interact with the environment at the edge. And so you have sensing that takes... Uh, physical signals from the environment con uh, converting into uh, signals. Then you convert signals to symbols, and then you have this box in the middle, which is the AI machine that its goal is to actually make uh, decisions, inference, and learn new, better models. These are contextual models that uh, have compos uh, composability to drive uh, and adapt, uh, to drive future decisions, and they are grounded in uh, actual physical reality. Then we have reasoning, oops. So let's take an example of that model and let's try to do actual recognition without a camera. Now, like a bat. So this may sound incredible and impossible. And uh, when we first did this work and we tried to publish it to PAMI, we sent it in and got rejected. Basically, you cannot do actual recognition without a camera. Um, but in fact, we can. So let's say, let's talk about actions. It's a simple raising your arm. Then the sensing, we have like a little bud, which is a simple box on the bottom uh, with um, two transducers, acoustic transducers, to actually emit sound and detect sound back. And we're gonna use a micro doubler. I'm gonna describe about that. We have high dimensional data also when we're actually gonna be doing training, which is RGBD data from the Kinect. And, all, and so the low dimensional database are basically their time series of, uh, of, of a spectrogram representation of the action. So 
we put them in this framework where we have scalar poses from Kinect, ultrasound time series, spectrogram representations, rotation representations. We put them in the actual recognizer. We train the machine, and, and at the at uh, at the action time when we're going to at run time, we only use the acoustic signals. So perception. This is where signals uh, become symbols. This is the uh, micro doppler. It's basically the doppler effect is the shift of the frequency of the wave when there is a moving object or is emitted by a moving object. In this case, we emit the wave using our electronic bag, the little $1 transducers, and then it gets reflected back and we can, re we can see the reflections, these little bumps, which are really uh, around the center frequency, 40 kilohertz here for this transducer. Every bump there, it corresponds to a, a arm or a leg. And then when you're moving away, the, the, the frequency shifts are positive. Uh, when you're coming forward, shift, shifts are positive. When you're coming back, shifts are negative. So now um, we take that, we put them into models. We create uh, uh, both the uh, scale that poses models and also the time series models, action recognition models from the time series. And then we now in inference, we use low dimensional data which is micro doppler signature for the time series. Now, this is great. It works and we're getting performance close to what one will get with a camera for this uh, set of actions that we used. So, however, there is need to do learning at the edge and why? Well, and where does uh, generative AI comes in? Well, we want to enroll new users, number one. We want to improve robustness, model adaptation, and we want to alleviate data center energy expenses. So the end user pays for the electricity. This is the problem with the Alexa business model. Amazon pays for it. So the problem is that when deployed at the edge, the high dimensional data, which is the Kinect data, are not available to learn new novel, improve action scale gestures of new users. So we need a model that captures that, that is grounded in physical reality, and we need a generative model to create novel poses. So this is the approach quickly. The generative model is going to go into a physics model, create representations, uh, spectrogram representation of the acoustic uh, events, and then learn those new representations and improve your models. So this is what we're doing for generative AI model. We're going to use, um, uh, we're going to go down the, down the hood where AI, generative AI happens, which is really uh, conditional, conditional random um, uh, Boseman machines, and then when you enroll them, they become conditional deep belief networks. You can give them instructions for poses, uh, seats with poses, and it will generate new poses. Then you have a physics model that actually takes these poses in the machine and uh, will create uh, micro doppler returns. And here are three examples. I'm going to play them simultaneously where these are actions and poses and micro doppler data generated by the machine by seeding uh, the original representations. Uh, they look kind of natural, but they are not because they are generated by these generative AI models. So uh, it, this is kind of the most natural one. If you look at this, uh, you see the hand at the end is really kind of kind of an unnatural pose, but it doesn't matter. The, uh, so moving on, this generated micro doppler signature can be used now using local zero fusion learning to adapt the models. In general, this kind of computation will be done when you're not doing actions, when the machine is sitting there doing nothing. Now, hallucinating can be troublesome. This is real micro doppler data. These are hallucinating, uh, hallucinated data. And sometimes they have more or they are missing leads. This is a common problem with generative AI. This is the, uh, this is a, uh, a list of references to how this work. Moving on, what are we going to use LLMs? Now we're going to use LLMs to create new generation of AI chips. This is the second part of my talk. It's going to go quickly. So can we write chips using natural language and LLMs? A lot of all speakers have talked about that. That's very exciting. We have done that. We created, a, uh, we used ChatGPT to create a small spiky neural network with SPI interface. Um, the amount of knowledge that the LLMs capture 
is really the kind of knowledge that you have on GitHub, which is really not much. Integrated fire neurons, SNMs, SPI, very little, but it's enough to actually allow us to do that. Uh, here is a prod, right? A very low module for a leaky integrated fire neuron. It sure did something. It told us that you need to simulate. Now we, we have a neuron. Can you create a layer of two neurons? It sure did something. However, it created a 2D arrays. And when we want to synthesize chips, we cannot do that. So we told him that, why don't you do the right thing? Uh, create one dimensional list. And sure enough, it generated the, the chip with SPI interface. Again, also the SPI interface generated automatically. The uh, design was submitted in tiny table five using an open source RTL GDS flow that uh, Mohammed talked about in the previous slides. And we're hoping the chips will be back by May, but apparently they're coming in July. And so that's work done at the Telluride Neuromorphic Engineering Cognition Workshop 2023. Future work, we want to give uh, a top module and we want to actually create test benches. That's really the hard problem with actually generating new chips, generating test benches to really um, verify your chip is really the big challenge. And uh, take your time and uh, to really um, look at this. This is really the workshop that we did the work. This is the 30th year anniversary. Uh, take a picture of the uh, QR code there and join us. The summer applications are open and that's the end of my talk. And this is my group. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andreas. That was a really great presentation. Huge thanks to all of our partners. Um, wouldn't be possible without you. We have AI Zip, Arduino, ARM, Brainship, Edge Impulse, which is where I work, Embed You Are, Efficient, Greenwaves Technologies, Gravetti Inc., Hymax, Imagine Mob, Infineon, Inatera, Nota AI, NXP. P&G, Corvo, Qualcomm, Renesas, Schneider Electric, Sensi ML, Sony, Silicon Labs, ST, Synaptics, Sentient, and TDK. These are our strategic partners. We also have executive strategic partners, Qualcomm AI Research, who are advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. Sentient, who are accelerating your edge compute, making edge AI a reality. And our platinum strategic partners, Embed UR, Atrios, who deploy Vision AI at the edge at scale with Sony. And our gold strategic partners, Arm, building the future of Tiny ML, Edge Impulse, the leading development platform for Edge ML, Infineon, driving decarbonization and digitalization together and Renesas, who are enabling the next generation of AI-powered solutions that will revolutionize every industry sector. ST Microelectronics, who provide extensive solutions to make tiny machine learning easy. Synaptics, who are engineering exceptional experiences. And our silver strategic partners, AIZIP, Arduino, Brainchip, Efficient, Greenwaves, Gravetti, Hymax, Imaginob, Inatera, Nota AI, NXP, P&G, Schneider Electric, Sensi ML, Silicon Labs, and TDK. Thank you to all of you. And that's to wrap up our session here. Huge thanks to the audience and all of the presenters. We've had an amazing couple of days of insights and inspiration to go forward and build great things. So thank you so much, everybody, again, and um, I hope you enjoyed it.